again, Melissa with Elusive Productions, welcoming you to episode two of our four video series in honor of the completion of the Rite of Saturn, which was released to the public on May 1st, 2020. This is the culmination of 20 years of work that we're super proud of, and we're taking the opportunity to present you with this seven video series outlining the top lessons that we learned in the process and, and the things that we did along the way. So our first episode was uh, going through the lens of the four Kabbalistic worlds as a method of turning dreams into reality and the problem solving that goes with that and learning to love that process even when your reality doesn't always match the big dream you started out with. In episode two, we're going to go a little bit deeper into that process through uh, the examination of a phrase that I used often with the cast, and many of them will probably remember, uh, that I often was quoted as saying, simplify, do not embellish. And that's the title for this episode too, simplify, do not embellish. Now, this may seem to be directly in opposition to the stated directives, go big or go home, dream big, have lots of ideas, uh, add theatricality, add plot, add character to, to these rites that S. Crowley wrote them. Um, but it's really quite necessary in this process to recognize that every project has a line. It may be a spoken, understood, definitive line where you say this happens, or it could be just a feeling. And often in my work, it was a feeling as a director of these productions as to when was the line where you stop dreaming and started looking at the hard facts of reality. How much time do we have left? What are the skill set of our cast? Uh, what, how much money is left in the account? What can we accomplish within the parameters of the reality set out before us? We have a theater booked. We have tickets sold. We have a finite number of rehearsals available to us. And some of my ideas were kind of complex. They might be having some difficulty getting it. I might be having difficulty communicating it. So where do we draw the line and say, whatever we had planned, we need to scale it back. Whatever great idea that you've had, we need to say no. If we had started it a few weeks ago, maybe it could have worked. But today, with the amount of time we have left, with the amount of resources we have left, what can we accomplish? So simplify, do not embellish has been a huge part of the rites of Eleusis as we've gone forward and realized we have to shape our production to the reality that we're living within. We have a few really great examples of that that I'm going to go through. One of the biggest through lines through all seven, well, almost all seven of the rights, not all of the rights have what we fondly refer to as a 963, um, but many of them do. And 963 is shorthand for Lieber 963. It's a group of poems written by JFC Fuller that Crowley used in the rights. Uh, they have uh, each of them, their sections based on each planet. The rights, therefore, often call for the section related to the planet or to one of the officers in the right to um, be recited. And so there, each section has 13 verses and has some very obscure language. The scansion is all over the place. And J.F.C. Fuller became fondly known in the rights of Eleusis for Elusive Productions as Jesus fucking Christ Fuller because... When we have 963, we have a big challenge. We have a very lengthy piece of music that could run anywhere from, you know, they're averaging like 15, 20 minutes long, and they don't have a, a, a structure that lends itself very well to verse and chorus, and it can, if not attended to properly, be a, just a really long, ask of an audience to sit through a 963, not to mention how lengthy and tricky it is for our vocalists to remember all of these lines that go on and on and on. So the 963 was always a particular challenge for us and often had 
a full company number. We would make it interesting by using choruses and harmonies and then having a lot of action to go behind it so that the fact that the story was symbolic and visual but not necessarily plot driving uh, could be um, worked around by adding action and emotion and different kinds of um, interactions of the cast members while we were delivering a 963. So often my ideas going in to rehearsals for these were pretty complicated. And here's some examples just to show you how I would try to convey my understanding of what was in my head with the cast. Now, the Rite of Luna contained our first 963, and from it we learned a couple of things. In particular, don't write a part for a particular person's spectacular range, because there is always a chance that this person will not be the one who's ultimately cast. A lot can have, life can happen between composing and performing. So a 13 verse song that modulates up a half step every verse is going to be very taxing for someone who isn't trying to do it. Uh, it was also an experience that taught us to pay more attention to what the characters are doing during a 963. Action keeps people's attention, especially when they are bombarded with what has been called a JFC Fuller word salad. For the Rite of Mercury, the next one in our production schedule that contained a 963, we were faced with an even more daunting task because the script called for not one, but two sections of the 963. And you can see here on this slide, uh, several of the verses side by side from both of those sections. And we decided that Wow, that's 26 verses, two different poetic patterns, a lot of music, and a lot of challenge in terms of how to communicate this in a way that would be engaging for the audience. So we had the bright idea that we were going to do them simultaneously. And here is an example of a little snip of how that sounded. So that shows you how complicated the sounds became and keeping in mind too that at that point in our productions we were not uh, using headset microphones everybody were trying to project to the back of the house just with by virtue of the strength of people's voices it was really challenging uh, adding to that the whole theme in mercury of the transmission of the word and the way that the word gets garbled up in translation as it descends from the spiritual realm into the world of physical reality. And we had this crazy act of all of these people running around trying to communicate truth in their imperfect human ways. And it actually really nicely reflected that idea. Um, but it was a pretty challenging uh, piece to work out with the cast and uh, it, we learned a lot from that in particular. Thankfully, Mercury is the only such rite that had two of these, and we were able then to move on to just doing them one at a time after that. Here is a great picture from the rite of Mercury that captures that idea. The cast members through the 963 have assembled their holy book, which um, no accident kind of resembles a book of the law although it's not entirely meant to be it, uh, they have all put their own version of the truth that they have received and they've put it into this holy book and they're very attached to their book. Uh, and in our next episode, uh, episode three of the series, Stay in Your Lane, we're gonna talk about a really cool thing that happened with that book in the Rite of Mercury. Continuing on, just to demonstrate the challenge that occurred and how complex some of these scenes could be, 
I have on the left here is an image from uh, notebooks from the right of Seoul, where I'm trying to figure out what is the cast going to do, where are they going to stand, um, and that you can see if you look closely into the notes that often I don't even understand yet what the dimensions of the set pieces are. All we know is we're going to create a multiple tiered ziggurat upon which Seoul will be enthroned. And I'd like a kind of marketplace feel for this community. And then on the right, you can see what actually came to pass, which is kind of cool that it, in this case, pretty similar to what was envisioned. Um, but then all of the pathways, where do the people move? Where do they hit their marks? Um, this is a process that anyone who's been involved in theater will know it, it takes a little bit of doing and, and some strong communication, which early on, before I developed my sense of, of how to do that, not having a super strong theater background other than some plays in high school, um, was quite a bit of a learning curve. So um, really excited to see looking back, I did have some pretty good methods, even though I had to trial and error it quite a lot. This one was super fun and also a really big challenge. I came to Mars with this really great idea. I thought that we would use fence panels on casters. At the Black Box Theater, we were using doesn't have a curtain. It could act as a curtain, and it could also be a prop in this military environment for Mars. And uh, the cast could rearrange them on the stage, and we could use them to create depth and interest. And um, most especially, I wanted to use them in the 963 as these props to show the integration of two groups of people and their interactions. And I thought that the fence panels would be a really great way to show that these people, at least at the start, are divided and how that changes through the number. Um, so the cast thought I was crazy and they were like, I don't know what you're talking about. What? What do you mean? We even brought the fence panels in as early as possible into the rehearsal process just so we could practice them. And thankfully, our uh, rehearsal space allowed us to store them on site. Uh, it took a lot to figure out, including a few rounds of simplifying and finding ways to make the action visible. Um, each of the cast involved received a whole packet of pages like the one you see here on the left that document and visuals like the cues for uh, who moves where and when on what verbal vocal cue. Um, and eventually it did work. It kind of clicked together and um, the end product was pretty amazing. In Mars, we created two squads, one led by Brother Ares that was styled after US military bodies. And uh, verses in the 963 for that group were inspired by the marching cadence songs used by those groups. And then the second squad was led by Brother Capricornus, had a more tribal, earthy approach inspired by the Hakka, the Maori tribes of uh, New Zealand. And the results were a 963 that had a lot of variation, showed a lot more character motivation and development. And by the end of the number, our soldiers having tested each other were better prepared to work together under the banner of Mars. And um, because it's such an interesting take, I want to play for you a song. schematics for Mars turned out to be 
a huge success, which I picked up in the rites after that. So you can see here's an example from the rite of Jupiter. Uh, this big center circle is the carousel that you can see in the background on the picture on the right and uh, creating um, a key and, and ends up looking a little bit like football plays drawn on a blackboard. Um, but it really was very useful in helping people to figure out like, where am I supposed to be right now? Uh, we and got even more fancy using graph paper to make sure everything was to scale in the right of Saturn. Uh, incidentally, that circle is the same platform that was the carousel in right of Jupiter, but we reconstructed it into a stone circle, which, spoiler alert, becomes a church um, in the right of Saturn. And just watching that come together is a pretty amazing feat that required a lot of re repetition and breakdown and uh, a lot of very specific instructions for the cast. But in the end, as always happens, it's like they say in Shakespeare in Love, it feels like everything is falling apart and then suddenly magically um, it all comes together and it's a mystery. That's a terrible paraphrase, but I think you get what I'm saying. So those were fun, right? Um, I highly recommend if you get a chance to uh, review those scenes in our videos and you can uh, have access to those through the link in the comments to our Vimeo site. Um, to check out how those scenes actually played out, so to speak. Um, they're really fun when you look at them to think about how much work it goes into teaching and learning all of those lines, all of that movement. And um, as crazy as it was to try to learn those things in rehearsal, I'm pretty proud of how they turned out. Another example that we have um, from the Rite of Venus shows that sometimes creating the simple solution can actually add a lot of value that you did not actually anticipate. Um, late in the rehearsal process for the Rite of Venus, we were reviewing the script and listening to the soundtrack and realized that we had completely skipped over a line. There's a line in the Rite of Venus where Pisces says to Venus, Mistress, let the adorations be performed. And we had skipped it in our composition and recording of the soundtrack. Uh, and this created quite a problem because we'd have the music was in the can, the cast was learning the music as we'd written it. How could we go back? It would take a lot of work to go back and rewrite a whole section to insert the line that we'd forgotten. So what we did instead, the simpler option, was to insert a whole new piece of music into the middle of that section. And we recorded just the repeated line, Mistress, let the adorations be performed, over the top of some music. And it was amazing how much it added to the story to the feeling, to the relationship between Pisces and Venus. And um, here we have a clip showing how that looked on the stage. Uh, and when you see the entirety of the Rite of Venus and imagine this scene not being there, I think once you see it, you'll agree a lot would be missing.
That was fun too. This is memory lane for me and I'm really enjoying it. I was so young then. Um, and what a great performance. Um, so thanks for joining us for this episode two. I hope that you're finding these interesting as we go into the things that we learned and the way that we went through our process in the creation of the rights of Eleusis as rock operas. Please check out the links in the comments and uh, stay tuned for our next episode. Episode three will involve, um, I believe we've decided to call it, stay in your lane. Until next time.